welcome everyone and thank you for joining us virtually for the suitcase project in the age of COVID-19. My name is Melissa Yumi Bailey. I am program development associate here at the National Japanese American Historical Society and I will be your host tonight. Thank you for joining our very first live stream program. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone is registered for this program. We want to maintain this forum as a respectful and safe space. So we ask you to abide by the rules spelled out in your invitation. We will keep the chat room open for your questions, comments, and concerns. Let us know if you have technical issues and we will do our best to help you. The broadcast is being recorded and will be available on the Ninja's website and YouTube channel for free after this broadcast tonight. So before we started the program, we sent out an, a survey to our audience. So we wanted to just kind of see where everyone was joining us from. So give us a second, we'll pull up those results. All right, so if we take a look here, it looks like the bulk of you tonight are joining us from right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you. Um, and as you can see, the next, um, biggest population of our audience is joining us from Canada. So that's very exciting. We're really, really glad to have you joining us and have an international audience tonight. So we had a few other survey questions as well. Um, we were just curious how many of our audience identify as Nikkei. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Nikkei is defined as being a person of Japanese ancestry that lives outside of the United States. Next, sorry. Um, so as you can see, the majority of our audience tonight actually does identify as Nikkei. And we're going to our last question. Now we were just curious on also the generation spread um, that we're seeing in our audience tonight. So it looks like the bulk of you are identify as Sansei. With the next um, most popular is being Yonsei, so we're very excited to see the youth also in this program tonight. Um, we also have Gosei, as well as, um, sorry, one second, I'm just having the survey jump, um, as well as people who identify as other um, generations, whether that's Yonsei, Gosei, Rokusei, other generations that we know. Okay, so. We'd like to begin our programs with a short reflection. Um, so we'd like to take a moment now to reflect and acknowledge that San Francisco, the location from where we are presenting, is located within the occupied territories of the Ohlone people and the coastal Miwok. We remember their continued connection to this region and give thanks to them for allowing us to live, work, learn, and pray on their traditional homeland. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce our first guest for tonight's program before we launch into the next section. So we are lucky to have the creator of the suitcase project here tonight, um, and Kayla Isomura. So we're gonna just pull up Kayla real quick. Hello. <laughs> yep, we, there you are. Hi Kayla, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good. All right, so, um, Kayla Isomara, um, in case you don't know, is the photographer and curator of the Suitcase Project, and she's joining us tonight from Vancouver, Canada. So we'd like to extend our deep gratitude to the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center for their loan of the Suitcase Project to us, and this is the first U.S. showing of this exhibition, so we're very excited. Thank you for your support in this endeavor. Next, we will move into playing a series of video and audio excerpts from the Suitcase Project. The Suitcase Project asked Yonsei and Gosei, fourth and fifth generation Japanese, Canadians, and Americans, what they would pack if uprooted from their homes in a moment's notice. While these descendants of the Canadian and U.S. incarceration never had to endure the same forced uprooting as their ancestors, Kayla's work examines how they, and those descended from the families that experienced this remain affected by the history today through a series of photographs, short films, and interviews. Over the course of nearly three months, more than 80 subjects ranging in age and background shared their stories from cities in British Columbia, Canada, and Washington in the United States. Here is the Suitcase Project. 
Kai and myself and the rest of our family all went on pilgrimage to Minidoka this past summer too, so I thought it was very timely because having actually physically been to where our family was incarcerated, this kind of took on another meaning as well. My name is Allison Shigaki. I'm a Japanese American who is a fourth generation, or Yonsei. I'm the mother to Kai, who is a two and a half year old boy, and I'm 51 years old. Well, I learned about this project from my sister Erin, and after reading about it and going to your site, I thought it was a really interesting thing to think about, um, especially with everything going on in the United States and just the world today, and to really just be able to reflect on what my family has gone through in the past. So I had um, selected several family photos and a lot of photos of Kai from the time he was born up through now that I have in a book. The family photo was of our extended family when they had come out to my graduation in medical school. And so I've also packed my stethoscope because I figured that there'd be a good chance I would be able to work in the camp, if not just provide medical care for other people. Many people in my family have gone into different vocations where they are trying to help other people, especially underserved people. I'm a family physician and for a long time I worked in a community health center, mainly working with immigrants and refugees. And I think hopefully it also has provided me that voice to be able to speak up for other people who don't always have that voice or feel too scared to be able to speak for themselves. I wanted to participate in the project because I went from over the course of my life being not terribly uh, interested or knowledgeable about internment uh, as Japanese American and then over the course of my life I've gotten to a point where it's something that it's not something that happened to other people, it's something that happened to people like me. And that's become more relevant now in, uh, with what's going on in the US and modern politics and the way that we're starting to look at our own citizens. And it's forced me to consider to what degree do I feel like I understand what it means to be singled out and how can I use the history of who I am to help keep things like that from happening again. I'm Andrew Hamada. I'm 34 years old. I'm fourth generation Japanese American from Hawaii on one side and fifth generation on the other. So the most important thing I packed was actually my work laptop. I work for Amazon.com. It's a big multinational, uh, very powerful company. And one of the interesting things about that is that they actually have uh, protocols and systems in place to help people like us in the event that something goes wrong, horribly wrong, like uh, the government decides to confiscate everything or a natural disaster occurs. And so I don't think they had internment in mind, but they would be in a position to help me a lot. And so uh, that's extremely comforting, obviously, for me personally. And then beyond that, the laptop then quadruples and doubles and triples as a, uh, a connection to the internet. As I, was, as I was doing the packing, it occurred to me that I had another choice, you know, that I don't have to comply and that that might have implications for my life and my safety and all these other things. But I, I, I was getting so angry as I was packing, just so furious at being forced, at the idea of being forced to make these choices about myself and my life. And in the context of what I described earlier, this being a moment for us uh, as Japanese Americans to kind of be the symbol of this having happened before in our country. I don't think I would go along quietly. And you know, one of the weird things about us being Americans is that we're very comfortable with the idea of fighting and standing our ground. Uh, everybody owns guns and stuff. And frankly, like that would be, that was the decision that I thought I was gonna make in my head after I talked to my wife and she said, no, I would stick with you. I said, hell yeah, let's, let's think about this. And I think that's what we'd actually do. We're already prepped for things like natural disasters and emergencies of that nature. We've got months of food and water here. We have all kinds of other preparation supplies, and I think we'd, we'd make a stand.
And I think in some ways, like I sensationalized the incarceration and it lost some of its humanity in that. And it's not that I thought like, oh, everyone was like, you know, terrified and like, dr like overly dramatized. Cause I just kind of imagined my bachan taking care of business. My name is Christina Shimizu. I'm 32 years old and second generation-ish Japanese American. My family's generationally, I guess, sort of mixed because my dad didn't move here until he was 13. And that was his experience. He, his experience was very much like a first generation immigrant to the United States and very different from his brothers and sisters who grew up in the camps and then went back to Japan and fell out of place there and then out of place here, you know? So we all have these different histories and stories and identities tied up to this story. I think that it, it it's shaped us and it's also made it harder for us to connect in certain ways, being that we all have very different identities and experiences. You hit the brass bowl and you pray to your ancestors and you say, Namoe dabutsu, Namoe dabutsu, Namoe dabutsu. And that is very meaningful to me because it connects me to my ancestors. And I could not live without it because I need to be connected to them. And so I light candles and do the same thing that I got to see her do, but for my Bachan and Meiji Chan and all my ancestors before me. So if I were going through something like this, I would really need to have that with me. And I, even just going through day-to-day -day life, <laughs> I have that with me. So I try to carry on that tradition. Although I will say that um, something that my Bachan always said was, thank you, thank you. She said thank you two times in a row. Not once, it was always thank you, thank you. And she was so grateful, even despite going through the trauma of the incarceration. And that strength to me stood out. And it was something that I really like grew to appreciate and understand as an adult. But as a child, I didn't see the nuance of her strength. You know, she's one of the strongest people that I've ever known. My sister signed me up for this project because she thought it was good to connect with the important Japanese history in Canada. My name is Koli Samura and I'm 12 years old. I decided to pack a baseball and a mitt and the baseball has a New York map on it. And I got it when I was born because my dad really loved baseball and it was one of my gifts. And I also packed a New York Rangers jersey because they're my favorite team right now. And I also packed a Canucks ticket because uh, that was the first and only game that me and my dad went to. And so I like thought that was important because I can remember him. The hardest thing to think about was me leaving my house because my house has all the important stuff and like valuable stuff to me that I need and it also comforts me. I think it is important to learn about the Japanese Canadian history because we don't learn it at school and so we need to find our own ways of learning it like our parents or someone else.
There's a lot of history that is buried and a lot of schools are not teaching really significant pieces in, in history and everything is often overlooked. But I think when you combine history and art, that, that message is really strong. My name is Danielle Higa. I'm 33 years old and a fourth generation Japanese American. The item that was most important to me would be the photo of my family, just because, you know, my cousins and I and my siblings, we don't live together anymore. Um, many of them live outside of uh, Seattle. And so for me to have photos with them to carry with me, you know, if, if we're under this type of trauma, I think would be a little therapeutic. I wanted to participate in this project because I appreciate that it's a creative project put on through the Yonsei perspective. And then also just kind of connecting back to my relatives and what they had to go through to prepare to, to leave. The project interested me because I'm interested in everything <laughs> about the internment and the experience. And especially I think what people of our generations, Yonsei, Gosei, are doing with the material and the ways that we're kind of diving into it and trying to, you know, keep spreading the message about it. I'm Erin Shigaki. I'm a Yonsei Japanese American and I'm 48 years old. I decided that the item that's most important to me is the this pairing of charms, I guess. The gold one is something that my dad had made for me and my sisters, and it's our the Shigaki family mon or crest. And the wooden piece is made by my friend Paul Kogita, who I met on Minidoka Pilgrimage. And he was interned as a kid, and his father was a woodworker there or before and did a bunch of beautiful wood pieces while in camp um, and managed to bring a bunch of pieces and like literal unfinished wood home to Seattle. And so a few years ago, Paul made some of those pieces into necklaces for folks at Minidoka. So I really, I cherish these two things. I think the topic of the Japanese incarceration is incredibly important because we continue to persecute immigrants, people of other faiths, black people, basically anyone different. It just rolls out wave after wave, including with, you know, threats of racial, racially based incarceration, and it's just an outrage. <laughs> And I feel that our community is uniquely positioned to stand up and be a voice and tell people these things that happened. I'm just, I'm very passionate about being part of sharing the story. I think I wanted to participate in this project for a few reasons. And I think I've managed to learn a lot about, you know, this history from books and, you know, documentaries, but I'd never taken the time to actually try and go through the thought process of, you know, what my uh, you know, family went through when they had to uh, pack up everything and leave their home. My name is Joseph Shoji Lockman. I'm 26 and I'm fourth fifth generation Japanese American. So the most important item to me uh, was actually McGruff. It's, it's my stuffed animal I've had since I think I was about five years old. And he's actually gone everywhere with me. He's gone with me to summer camp when I was younger, but also went with me to college and wherever I've lived, he's been there with me. and. I think it helps keep me grounded, kind of, anywhere 
if, if I have my gruff there, then I, I feel like, you know, there's something still grounding me and reminding me of a sense of kind of continuity in my life. You know, also as a fourth, fifth generation person, it makes me realize just how long it's been since we had anybody in the family who has memories of Japan. So it's really easy over time to become disconnected from that and the Yonseis and Goseis have to make a really uh, concerted effort to try and connect with that heritage and not just because you know, it's been that long, but also because historically you know, um, systemic oppression really forced us to abandon a lot of our traditions and our language and our culture. So it makes me realize how important it is for us to try and actually embrace and uh, preserve parts of our culture that have been passed down to us. I feel like knowing where you come from can be a very in, like good way to sort of figure out where where you're going. My name is Kieran and I'm 14 years old. When I received that notice, I at first I think the first thing I thought was like how much is that actually like 75 pounds? How much can I actually take? It ended up being more than I thought it was, which was a relief, but I thought like, I was like, am I gonna have to like make tough choices about what I'm gonna be able to bring? The most important thing that I decided to pack was a stuffed rabbit that I've had since I can remember. It's not a very practical thing, but the, he's kind of been like an anchor throughout my life. I used to bring him everywhere with me because if he was with me, I would feel safe, and I still bring him on trips, especially longer trips, in case I get homesick, because he's just, if he's there, then everything's kind of okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess something that I wish I could bring, but I don't think I could, was my cats. I don't know, I don't know what would happen to them if they were alone, and I don't know, maybe somebody that we know would take care of them, but I know that they'd be, they, they would miss us. So that was sort of a sad thing that I'd have to leave. The Japanese internment is important today. I think it has um, sort of reflections in the refugee crisis that's happening like all over the world right now. It's a similar thing, like you don't have a lot of time to figure out what you're gonna do. It's important to keep sort of feeling like a connection to that. Cause it's, there's always gonna be people in t tough situations like that. And um, it's important to remember the terrible things that have happened so that it, we can figure out how not to do it again. I decided to participate in this project because I've always known about my Japanese history, but I've never been able to, or I've never had the chance to really explore it and understand really where, where I come from and what I'm, that part of who I am. So this project was a really cool way to connect with the Japanese Canadian part of myself. Yeah, it's really opened my eyes to sort of how much of this community there is. It wasn't just like, World War II ended and then incarceration's over, so we're closing the book on it now. Like, it just totally changed the dynamic of the Japanese diaspora. My grandpa's life in Japan shaped my dad's life here, and my dad's life here shaped my life, so I am the person I am today because incarceration happened. All right, thanks everyone. So that was a selection of excerpts from the Suitcase Project. And so now we're gonna move next into a conversation with Kayla Isomura.
All right. Hi, Kayla. Hi. <laughs> so we just have a few questions for you to get started. Um, I guess first, um, for the audience, can you explain the difference between the Japanese American and Japanese Canadian incarceration? Yeah, so um, I think one of the biggest differences, um, let me just <laughs> cut some notes here. Um, so basically during 1942, when the internment and incarceration happened, one of the biggest things, or not one of the biggest things, but something to note, um, is just thinking about like the population size difference between Canada and the US. So in Canada, it was 22,000 Japanese Canadians who were removed from the coast. Um, whereas I think it was about over 100,000 100, Japanese Americans um, who were removed from the coast. So it kind of speaks to um, the different size of population that there was here in Canada versus in the US. Um, and after Japanese Canadians were removed from the coast um, in 1943, um, the government decided to dispose of Japanese Canadian property without consent from their owners. And a lot of the money from the sales of that property went kind of to pay for the Japanese Canadian um, internment and incarceration. Um, and I think, so that was kind of a really big thing was that included like property, um, like vehicles, boats, um, things within the homes that people didn't take with them um, to, um, to the internment camps. And then later um, in 1944, our Prime Minister made a recommendation that, that Japanese Canadians be dispersed across Canada and that they did not return to the coast. So it's really interesting because in 1945, Japanese Americans were allowed to return to the West Coast. Um, and I know that not everybody did, but it wasn't until 1949 that Japanese Canadians were free to return to the coast. Um, but prior to then, they were asked to move east of the Rocky Mountains or be exiled to Japan. So actually about 4,000 people actually did go to Japan um, after the war. Oh, wow. So, yeah, so, so like, I think that is the major differences, I think, between our histories. Um, so I guess now, um, knowing the difference between the Japanese Canadian and Japanese American incarceration, um, what inspired you to do this project in the first place? Um, and w since you talk about both the Japanese Canadian and Japanese American incarceration in this. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'm a Yonsei, I'm a fourth generation Japanese Canadian. So my grandparents and my great grandparents um, were interned here in British Columbia. Um, but yeah, so basically as a result of that, my dad essentially was born and raised in um, Eastern Canada in Montreal. Um, and um, eventually his family moved, uh, moved back, I guess, to, to BC. But um, my, his parents and his grandparents had passed away before I was born. So for me, I didn't really feel like I learned this history until later, until I was like in my early 20s. Um, and that's when I kind of started to learn about the history and kind of question I guess like the role of that within my family. So related to that, I came, actually came back from a backpacking trip and kind of had this question about packing and thinking about um, what they might have packed with them. But not only that, like knowing the, the history that we have here in Canada, like what were they forced to leave behind? So like, what were those things? Like what, was, what were those homes? What were uh, potentially those boats um, and like the things that they had? Like, I know that my dad's mentioned that our family or his family kind of, he, like, never really had a lot. But even then, it's like they would have had something or, like, some things they would have left behind. So what resonated for you most when photographing other subjects and interviewing them for the project? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for me that resonated was thinking about the diversity in ages and backgrounds and experiences in the participants. So I had participants uh, participate who were like babies to like um, 50, 
50-ish years old and they all identify as fourth, fifth generation Japanese, Canadian or American. And I thought that was really interesting because like, like I said, like I didn't really learn about this history until I was in my 20s. Um, so when I met like the kids and the teenagers who, who were participating, because either they were interested in this history or their parents were interested in like teaching them about this history. Um, that was something that really like blew my mind because when I was in high school, like I was definitely not kind of really aware of this history. Um, and so for me, that was like a moment of like, wow, like these kids are so smart. Like they're, they're, you know, or their parents like for, for wanting to talk about this with them. Um, and even thinking about the, the experiences of different people and different families, like in the videos that we watched, um, like the experience of like, well, what if your family had gone to Japan um, after the war, but then come back and like the complexities of that or having family who weren't necessarily interned or incarcerated, but would have experienced um, probably racism and discrimination at um, some degree. Um, so I thought like those were things that were really stood out to me when I was doing that. So now with this changed time that we're in, um, like all of us, um, I know that you've been going through some things. Um, and so has anything changed for you in what resonates about the project now compared to when you were first putting it together? Yeah, I think over the past couple of years, um, there's just been like a lot of, I think, learning and growth like for myself over the last few years and how that's also impacted how I want to do work within the Japanese Canadian community and bring people together and to like my place in that, like in terms of just meeting, um, like, you know, for a lot of people when they're introduced to the community, for some people it's the first time that they're meeting other, other folks um, and people are always gonna be at different stages um, with that knowledge and history. And so I think for me now, I'm sort of at a place of looking at the effects of this history and knowing the um, I think the context of that and like what does that mean for me now and like what does that mean for the work work that I do now and this, the work that I support now and the communities that I'm um, I want to stand with um, just knowing like the experiences and the histories of our family of or of my family um, and so I think for me like maybe that's something is like that learning and that growth and like that change in like how I once viewed this history or like how I once learned about this history to like how I view it now and want to use that. Great. Um, so now we're gonna take a moment to pull a couple questions from the audience chat. Um, so this first question is from Thomas. Um, so I might need some clarification, Thomas, if I'm interpreting your question correctly. Um, but the question is, there's a, there, he, Thomas is curious about comparing and contrasting a similar age group. So were any of your participants about the same age as their ancestors who were incarcerated when they participated in the project? Do you know? And did anyone talk about that? Sorry, can you? Yeah. Um, were yeah. any of the Yonsei or Gosei the same age as their Issei or Nisei? When they um when they were incarcerated and when they participated in the project were they the same age as their ancestor who was incarcerated um i would imagine so um i think something that was interesting about this project was not really going through people's personal histories and family experiences but more about them as like a yonsei or a gosei and like just that general thinking of like how that history has impacted them or played a role in their life but yeah I mean I would imagine so like I think um there's just such a big range of the ages of people who were mm -hmm. interned and incarcerated so you definitely see some overlap and um we'll take one more question so um I know the project focused on Yonsei and Gosei so there's a question in the audience I'm asking if there were any Issei alive to participate in the suitcase project um so I'm 
you, you can, of course, answer that. Um, but besides Yonsei and Gosei, my question, I guess, is were there any other generations of Nikkei that participated? Yeah, I think technically the, the only person I could really think about was um, Christina's video where she talks about being second generation-ish um, because of her family's experience where her dad her, her, her grandmother was incarcerated, but her father was born in Japan, but then they came back to the US. Um, but it was really interesting because otherwise it kind of, my hard and fast rule was really just identifying as fourth, fourth and or fifth generation. Um, and I think that for, was for me was something about really our experiences um, as the younger generation. All right. Thank you, Kayla. Um, so that's, that concludes um, our portion right now of Q&A with Kayla, um, but we'll bring her back a little bit later. And now we're going to move into our next two panelists um, who are also, who are subjects featured in the suitcase project. So first, I'd like to introduce Steph Ikeda. Steph is the former Museum and Development Manager at the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington and is a current member of the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee. Steph is joining us from Seattle, so we'll have her have Steph pulled up right now, just one second. Hello. Hi Steph, how's it going? Going. Um, so, and then next, we're going to introduce our second panelist. Uh, joining all the way, uh, joining us all the way from Seminole, Florida, is Joseph Shoji Lachman. So, uh, Joseph is a Yonsei Gosei, born and raised in Seattle, Washington. After completing his undergraduate degree, including a year studying in Japan, he returned to Seattle and now works full time at Asian Counseling and Referral Service as their policy analyst helping to coordinate statewide legislative advocacy efforts in service of AAPI communities. Welcome, Joseph. All right, let's see, I'm just making sure. All right, hi, Joseph, can, can you hear us? Yes, sure. thank okay, you so great. much. Great, yeah. Thanks again, yeah, both of you for joining us. So um, we're going to go through the um, next Q&A part. Um, so again, audience, if you have any questions for our panelists, please enter them in the chat box um, and we'll get to them at the end of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to have each of you answer the next few questions. Um, so what resonated most um, in participating in the suitcase project? We'll start with Steph. Um, so what resonated for me most participating in the suitcase project was, um, like a lot of people said in the video, it's the personal experience of trying to imagine like what that would have been like, um, thinking about it as something happening to me personally and not just my family or something that happened a long time ago. Um, and similar to Kayla, but like as a Yonsei, I also didn't really grow up like with stories of knowing what happened to my family and it only kind of came out later but it really explained a lot about my family. And like I mentioned in the audio clip, like um, certain things about my family history really explained things that happened to me. And so I wasn't even aware that my family was incarcerated until I was um, grown up. And I'd always been interested in history. So just like making that connection was really powerful for me. And thank you. Joseph, what resonated for you? Um, first of all, Melissa, thank you so much for uh, you know, for having me part of this panel. And I'm so grateful to Kayla for um, in including us in it as well. And for me, what really resonated, and part of this was you know um, uh, sort of self-imposed time limit, perhaps. But you know, I, I gave myself very little time to prepare when Kayla and her folks are coming over for this, and I, I realized just how difficult it was for me to to think about what belongings I would take with me, what I would leave behind. Um, and I was actually very lucky, though, to grow up understanding a bit more about my family's experience, in part thanks to um, Ken Mochizuki and his um, children's books on the Japanese American incarceration experience, um, since he's a uh, family friend. Um, but it, it really made me think so much about what it would have been like for my family, but even, even more so for them, considering that my grandfather was um, carrying his disabled sister instead of uh, another uh, suitcase. And, um, considering that 
the circumstances that you know, my my family was in back then. Thank you. Um, so this question again goes to both of you. Now in the age of COVID-19 with everything changing in the world, our individual lives, um, what strikes you now about the project and has anything changed for you? And so Steph, we'll have you go first. Um, so yeah, in the, I mean, in the age of COVID-19, I think um, what's been on a lot of communities mind and also on my mind is just like how the anti-immigrant racism has come to the forefront, anti-Asian racism specifically, and how that ties into being like a forever foreigner. Like, you know, even though I'm a Yonsei, um, and I, you know, I, I've never lived in Japan or China or anywhere, I still, you know, can't escape being seen as Asian more than American. Um, and I think I feel more that way now in COVID than I did two years ago. And yeah, I just know that more community members, people I know, have experienced racism, threats and harassment just from strangers on the street. Um, but I mean, a lot of things are the same. I think I still feel really strongly, like, proud to be Asian American and proud to be Yonsei. So I think, you know, even though COVID is happening and we're all really stressed about that, um, like, that part of me hasn't changed. Thank you. Joseph, has anything changed for you? In terms of how I, you know, just looking back on it now and um, how I how I thought about it then versus now, I mean, a lot of it's so much the same in terms of um, thinking about, you know, that just very grave injustice that happened to my family. But in the age of um, you know, COVID-19, what's, I guess, really struck me is, you know, now I I worry about, because um, I'm, I'm here in Florida with my partner just for the time being during this um, pandemic, but uh, you know, worrying about my mother going outside um, in Seattle more than you know, I, I ever did before. Uh, and just, but then also thinking about the, um, the way this is further exposed, just the existing inequities in our society, especially towards um, people of color. Uh, and, you know, I think Stephanie, I, I think Steph really nailed it just by pointing out the anti-Asian racism part, uh, but also thinking the, in the detention camps that you know, that still exist to this day, that are modern concentration camps, uh, I think Den Show just did a great job highlighting, um, you know, the history and looking at how Japanese Americans had to deal with disease outbreaks in in the camps. But now we're seeing um, outbreaks of COVID nineteen, and you know, and there were other outbreaks that happened before um, in detention centers, but it's becoming, um, you know, just uh, some really cannot um, ignore at this point. And thinking about my family back then and I, my, uh, my great aunt who was disabled and actually died before she could even um, home from Minidoka, um, thinking about her medical conditions and thinking about even my own family now and being um, immunocompromised um, and just realizing how um, deeply this, this act really has resonated with me um, even more so um, mm -hmm. today. So you brought up um, current detention centers. Um, and as we all know, the Japanese American community has really been recently stepping up in the activist realm. Um, so we were just wondering um, this question, actually, actually I'm gonna open up um, the floor back up to all three of you. Um, how have you been participating in the current activism scene in the Japanese American community? And how does your, personal identity as Nikkei play into that. Um, so I guess we'll start with Steph. Sure. So, I mean, for me, um, working as a historian, I know that like Asian and Japanese American activism has historically been strongest when it's built on coalitions and, and groups of people and not just like a single, just not just like a single identity. Um, so I really want to continue to highlight that like we really need to be in solidarity with different kinds of people and like obviously be in solidarity as Japanese Americans and Asian Americans, but like also thinking beyond, I'm also thinking beyond that lately. Um, and I also want to recognize that like the Japanese American community has been really broken apart by incarceration and we're still feeling the effects of that today. And that also shows up in activism. Like it's like sometime, like I just talked about solidarity with other groups, but I know that solidarity within the Japanese American community um, has also been a challenge in some respects. 
and like being Nikkei and Asian American specifically, especially in activism, I often feel like, you know, if I'm not working until I'm exhausted, then I'm not doing good enough. Um, but I actually am trying to rethink that. And I think it's really important to contribute anything that you can do right now, like especially right now, anything, anything that you can do that you have the capacity for is going to help. Great, thank you. Um, and next, Joseph, do you have anything to add on your role in current activism in the Japanese American community? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. And, um, you know, one of the ways that um, I've had some ongoing engagement with community since um, the suitcase project is actually um, a documentary that I participated in by Megumi Nishikura, uh, which just documented my, my trip to Minidoka to see where my mother's family's uh, family was incarcerated. And you know, that was an opportunity for me to learn um, you know, about what they went through. And it actually really has um, uh, really informed the, the work that I'm doing now for Asian Counseling and Referral Service um, in Seattle, Washington, and uh, really just given me a lens, you know, that, that really uh, made me think about the Japanese American legacy and see that this was, it's not just um, a matter of preserving the history for our sake, but really for the sake of other communities that are facing oppression and um, really seeing the legacy as, um, you know, serving other communities um, who are going through these these uh, experiences. And it, it really made me think though of my, um, my great uncle Sam Shoji, uh, who was um, at Minidoka, but during the redress hearings, um, he was very active and he gave a quote to the Seattle Times where he said that, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he said that if it could uh, you know, happen to us, it could happen to anyone. And that forward thinking of his and really thinking about setting this, you know, a, the redress movement as a press, and it was really what has, I think, inspired me to, um, to see you know the continuing of this legacy as uh, something where we serve other communities that are they're facing uh, oppression in times. Great, thank you. Um, so Kayla, did you have anything more to add to, um, just in the last few topics we've been talking about? Um. Yeah, I think I feel very similar to Steph, where activism can doesn't activism doesn't really necessarily have to be um, showing up at a rally and like protesting or uh, participating in a march. I think there's so many different ways that that can look like. Um, I think it's interesting because for me, over the past couple of years, people have looked at the suitcase project and called that a form of activism when it's something like I've never used that label or I've never really thought about it in that way. But I think it's really important to use the tools and resources that you can um, to support other communities and even within our own community. Um, because there's a lot of, uh, like, it, just like Steph was saying, there's so much anti-immigrant and anti-Asian racism. racism. Um, but even like there's so many other groups and communities beyond that that who are continuing to face um, discrimination and racism. And even if it's using your wallet to support those communities. Like when I think about here in Vancouver, like more urgent communities and neighborhoods that need, um, I think that really need allies right now. It's thinking about like our Chinatown and our downtown east side, which um, there's a lot of um, marginalized and, um, people experiencing homeless in that er homelessness in that area. So it's like, how can, if I can't be there physically helping people, what can I, what can I do? And um, for me, that's like, you know, I'm really lucky that I still have a job right now. So I'm able to use that to try and um, support other people right now. Great. Thank you so much to all three of you. Um, so we're going to pull a couple questions again from the chat. Um, so I'll ha let each one of you have an opportunity to answer. So let me just give me one second. Let me just scroll up a little bit. Um, so one question was, um, sorry, oh, sorry, one second. Um, so I, there is one actually specific question about Canadian Japanese. Um, so the question was that um, Canadian Japanese, instead of 
um, concentration camps were put in labor camps, and that was a major difference between the two incarcerations. Is that the case? Do you know? Um, yeah, so I think it's a combination of different things. So one thing that happened in Canada at the time was that men were separated from their children or like from women and children. And so they were sent to labor camps. Um, uh, and um, But the women and children were sent to like internment camps. So they weren't necessarily forced um, to do labor or, or work. Um, and so the men were working on like railways or like road or like roadworks, um, that type of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Got it. Um, and the next question, um, this one's going to go to all three of you. Um, so COVID-19 has changed us all. Um, how is day-to-day -day life different for each of you? Um, and I guess we'll go in the order I see at the top. Um, so Kayla, Joseph, Steph? Yeah, so I think it's interesting. Um, I'm definitely spending more time at home. <laughs> um, but I think something that's been interesting for me is just throughout this, like something that I've just had to experience throughout this is like moving. Um, and that was a really interesting challenge in itself. Um, but aside from that, like now that I'm sort of settled into like my new home, it's mm. being at home more often, uh, not really doing um, a lot of meetups and gatherings as I previously would have. Um, and obviously, doing a lot more cleaning than I would normally. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hey, thank you. Um, Joseph, how has day-to-day life changed for you? I know you mentioned you've temporarily relocated from Seattle to Seminole, Florida, so I'm sure that's a big change. I mean, that's definitely the major change. Um, when you're in a long-distance relationship and you're going to be working from home anyways, mm -hmm. you might as well be sheltering in place with your partner. Um, actually, we're at our parents' place and um, her dog is also mm -hmm. here. So that's, you know, in terms of like taking care of my mental health, though, that's you know, it, it's actually a much better situation than being, I, I, you know, by myself, um, you know, and of course, I'm going to be, you know, I'll, I'll be back in Seattle eventually, but, um, but, you know, be, being this far away, of course, you know, I'm still thinking about the fact that I, I feel very lucky to have that technology, you know, available to be able to, you know, check in on my parents, uh, check in on my family and make sure that they're doing okay. I mean, if yeah, I'm even able to order them food, you know, like, mm -hmm. Um, and just thinking about, what, you know, the way that this would have, this impacted my family back then and then just not having access to these kinds of, um, you know, tools for, you know, caring for themselves and staying in communication really, again, just reinforces, um, you know, just how, uh, how much they, they had to do to, to persevere mm -hmm. and how actually in, you know, in my great aunt's case, though, you know, she, they were completely separated from her for, um, years and I, I feel very lucky though that I'm able to have that kind of contact still with all my relatives. Thank you. Uh, Steph, how has day-to-day -day life changed for you? Um, well, the main change is that I'm working from home, but I, um, like, like Joseph and Kayla, I'm very lucky to still have a job. Um, so I'm really, th and, that, and that does allow me to work remotely, so I'm really thankful for that every day also. Um, and I am not sheltering in place with family members or loved ones right now I but um, I'm with my roommates I'm not totally alone um, my family is in California so I, I didn't mention that um, I'm actually from Southern California originally and I've been in Seattle for the last several years so my family is all sheltering in place in California I'm up here that's a little hard not knowing when I can go see them um, but you know otherwise I'm just trying to be thankful for what I have Great, thank you. Um, so just looking at the time now, we're gonna pull just two more questions from our audience. Um, so we see one um, from Shelly. Hi everyone, I'm a Sanse in California. We were known as the quiet Americans. As Yonse, how hard is it for you to be activists and do you still carry that weight? So I guess we'll again go in the same order, Kayla, Joseph, and Steph. Um, I think there's a lot of uh expectations or even sometimes like i think stereotypes that uh the different generations carry and so i've definitely heard different things about yonsei for example about some people feeling like we don't really do enough in the community or that we're not interested in learning about our history 
And I think when people say these comments, it's kind of hard for those of us who are doing work in this community and who are trying to connect with our community or our culture or our history. Um, and at the same time, it's like, yeah, maybe Sansei, you know, sometimes people will label Sansei as, you know, the generation that is quiet. Um, but I also know a lot of Sansei who have done a lot of activism in the community. Um, and I think when we use these sort of like labels and have this different thinking about the different generations, we really need to scale back and look at why are these things things like, especially if we look at the history of our, of our um, community, as we're discussing internment and incarceration, like um, Sansei may be labeled as quiet Americans, but it's because their parents might not have talked about the history of, of their experiences to them. And so I feel that way definitely about my dad. And so when I think about why he never talked about this history with us, it's always like, oh, well, it's because he, he never learned it himself because his parents never talked about it to him. Great, hey, thank you. Um, Joseph, did you have a response to the, um, how hard is it for you as a Yonsei to be an activist? It's, I would say in terms of, you know, being a quote-unquote activist, it's one of those things, again, I, I also sometimes don't call myself. Um, it, it, it's interesting because I think there's um, a lot of trauma that was passed down to the Sansei in terms of, you know, not feeling able to speak up in terms of, you know, my, my mother really couldn't have some of those conversations with her Nisei mother about what they went through. And it, it's, it kind of became something that where as a Yonsei, I, as the, the, the first grandson, I was able to talk with my Bachan about that, talk about her, her time at Heart Mountain. Um, and I even realized actually after she passed away that she kept everything. So in a way that I, I think that she really did want me to help to preserve this legacy. And that gave me some of the inspiration and confidence to actually do this going forward. And her surviving sisters, when they saw some of the work that I'm involved in, you know, they, they told, you know, they told me how proud they are of me. And it really, you know, I, I teared up a little bit when they, you know, actually they told me before a bit about their experiences um, at Heart Mountain, but also looked at some of what my, my grandmother kept and then, you know, and, uh, and talked to them about some of the work that I'm doing. Um, you know, on the other hand, some of the um, most virulent, you know, some of the most toxic kind of caustic um, criticism I've gotten is from, um, you know, extremely conservative Japanese Americans who think that I don't have a right to, you know, speak on this legacy and that, you know, in some cases really um, come after me in ways that I, I think are inappropriate in terms of referencing um, my mixed race heritage. And actually all three panelists here, I think, can um, relate in that note. But, um, you know, and the, I realized though that when I get that kind of pushback, it's because it really is going to be a in a lot of ways to Yonsei and future generations and, you know, not ever disrespecting the, the work of our elders, but to, to do this moving forward. And, um, you know, I, it, it can be tough, but I, I think it's really worthwhile in the end. Thank you. Um, Steph, do you have a response as well? To the question about are we are we on the anti the uh, still the activism? silent generation? Oh, the sil oh yes, I yeah. do have I have a strong opinion on this because um, <laughs> I mentioned I mentioned that I didn't find out that my family um, was even incarcerated until I was older, mm -hmm. um, or because technically I guess although they consider themselves survivors of incarceration, they weren't in one of the WRA camps. They had fled to Utah and, and lived in hiding. Um, but they were still under military 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 surveillance and a military curfew, so they considered themselves um, interned or incarcerated, and that was never discussed in my family. Um, so I think, and like my like everyone in my immediate family, my parents and grandparents just kind of acted like, um, you know, like nothing really like nothing really happened. They never mentioned it. Um, so yeah, that's that was my experience was the silence. Um, and growing up in SoCal, even though I knew, like I knew a lot of Yonsei and growing up and there were a lot of other Japanese Americans in my community. Um, yeah, most of the, most of the young people, most of the young people I know are activists and not the, not my parents' generation. Although I know, like, 
later in life, obviously, after moving to Seattle, I met a lot of Sansei and Nisei activists who were really supportive of me. Um, but I know, just like growing up, I, I know that no one encouraged me to be an activist. Mm. Thank you. Um, so we're going to take our last audience question. Um, and again, this is going to go out to all three of you. Did any of the participants, I guess I can ask specifically, did any of you three learn what your family members packed when they were incarcerated if, in, in the case that they were incarcerated? Who's going first? Me? Um, if, yeah, let, uh, let's do reverse order. How about Steph first? Okay. Yeah. So even though I just mentioned that my family mm -hmm. wasn't technically incarcerated, they, so they, yeah, so they had sold everything that they possessed basically, um, because they thought they were going to get to go back to Japan. But when executive order 9066 went out, they had to basically run away overnight and lost everything. So they actually, I don't think they packed anything substantial, um, probably even less than if they were packing for the train. Um, so I think, I really think it was, it was almost nothing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Joseph, did you learn what your family members packed? So I, I did have the privilege of learning a little bit more about some of that family history because um, my great grandfather founded St. Peter's Episcopal Church, which is still around in Seattle. And so a lot of possessions actually that they didn't take with them, they were able to store at the church, um, which was actually an official WRA um, site during the incarceration. So a lot of possessions, um, they were in some ways lucky to be able to hold on to because they, you know, they were stored at the church, even though they actually ended up losing their home. The, the thing that was most, I think, heartbreaking for me, though, learning about uh, what my family took with them, it's learning that you know, my my grandfather, as the oldest son, you know, he, he left a lot more of his possessions um, because instead of you know, carrying a suitcase, he was carrying his little sister. And I, I, I just think the saddest part about that, that was also learning though, that he didn't, he wasn't able, he didn't get to carry her back because she was um, then put at the Idaho State School, which is essentially a, you know, a, um, kind of like a, an asylum for folks with disabilities and you know that was where um, she she died um, so you know I really did get to learn though a lot about what uh, my family brought with them what they brought back um, but I do feel like there was some privilege of being able to know some of that history and that's you know really um, something I've, I've always I've always uh, remembered in the work that I do Thank you. Um, and Kayla, um, coming from the Japanese Canadian side of things, um, did you ever find out what any of your family members packed? Yeah, so very recently, <laughs> like a couple months ago, actually. Um, well, I'm actually not for certain, but um, just very quickly, actually, before I go into that, I just want to acknowledge um, Lisa's question just or about the Sugar Beet projects, because I did forget to mention this with the the labor question earlier. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. <laughs> so um, just just a, something quick to note. Um, in Canada, we also had the sugar beet projects, and so these were offered as one of the few options for families to stay together, um, or like that's how the government had had put it. Um, and so these were in Alberta, Manitoba, and Ontario, um, where they would basically essentially be laboring on sugar beet farms. Um, and the population of the projects uh, was almost 4,000 by November 1942, with the largest population or the largest number of beet farming families in Alberta, which was interesting because it's actually a lot of families or a number of families have stayed in Alberta. So when we look at the largest populations of, um, of Nikkei or Japanese Canadians in Canada, it's like Vancouver and Toronto, but also there's a big population in Southern Alberta, and that's as a result of the war. So a lot of my friends in Southern Alberta have had a lot of different experiences being around Nikkei and growing up with their Nikkei identity than like for me, for example. Mm -hmm. But going back to the original question, um, I recently got uh, some documents um, that my family, that my great grandparents would have filled out um, before being interned. And one of them that I was looking at, um, it kind of, 
uh, like I'm looking at it right now and um, one of the questions on this form that they had to fill out was a statement of personal property owned. And so the only thing that my great grandmother listed at the time um, for personal effects was a one singer sewing machine um, located at their, their address um, upon evacuation to be stored at Crone Storage Company in Vancouver, BC. And then, um, and she was a tailor at the time. Um, and then the second thing that they had put um, under horses, livestock, and other animals, poultry, and pets was that they had in a black Airedale dog. And it's written that they would like to take the dog with them to Greenwood, which was the internment site they went to if possible. And if not, they will phone the SPCA. So aside from that, like that's kind of the information I know of and I'm not entirely sure what happened to things after then, but it's really interesting to look at these documents and even see like how much money they had in their bank account, which wasn't very much and where they were living at the time. Um, and that sort of information and even the occupation of like my great grandfather, one of them being a janitor and my great grandmother being a tailor. Um, Cause it really reflects that new immigrant. I think life of really not ha of not necessarily having a lot and just doing the jobs that you're given or not really having your first pick or whatever it is establishing a life and I think that's one of the very few things that I feel like my dad has brought up over the past couple of years it's just his family having or like his I guess his parents and his grandparents coming from that new immigrant type of life Hey, thank you, Kayla. Um, so now this concludes our program. Um, I want to thank Kayla, Steph, and Joseph so, so much for their participation in tonight's program. Um, I'm lucky enough to be friends with all three of you, um, but thank you. I really, really appreciate um, you coming out and getting on this call and doing this program with me tonight. Um, so um, just moving on, I Quickly, I'd like to thank our funders for tonight's program. Thank you to the Henry and Tomoya Takahashi Foundation at Grants for the Arts and our wonderful members and supporters of the National Japanese American Historical Society for making this event possible. And a special thanks again to the Nikkei National Museum and Cultural Center and Kayla Isomura for creating the suitcase project. Thanks for joining us tonight. And if you like this program and you want to see more, please help us by completing the survey that will be sent to your email. Your response will entitle you to a 10% discount in our online store. So thank you, have a good night, and stay well.